interviewing Basil Davis for the Muncie Labor Oral History Project. The date is February 8, 2006. Uh, Basil, I want to begin by thanking you for agreeing to help me with the project in, in many ways. I especially appreciate the opportunity to come out to the retirees meeting uh, a month or so ago at 499. But I've been asking everyone in this study if they would begin by telling me how you or your family happened to come to Muncie, Indiana. Well, me and my wife and our children was all born and raised here, but we, but in 52, we moved to Denver, Colorado. Oh, okay. And uh, we lived in Den Denver until uh, 62, uh -huh. when I had the opportunity to go to work for uh, General Motors at basically the Chevrolet Muncie plant. And my family was quite upset with me for moving them back here. <laughs> but I knew that I wasn't getting any younger and to get the benefits and things that, that they had, that I had to get inside. And by being a skilled tradesman, why, I had a good opportunity to go in as a skilled tradesman. <clears throat> so we did move back here. Uh, I took a, a dollar and 34 cent an hour cut and moved approximately 1,100 miles to take a job that would give a, uh, which has benefited me in the long run from the benefits <coughs> that they had that sure. we didn't have as an outside construction worker. Now, was this 1962 when you moved back here? Correct. Okay, so you, you went from Muncie to Denver, Colorado? Correct. Okay. And what, what, what specific job did you have in Denver? I was, uh, I finished my, uh, I'm a licensed plumber. I oh, am okay. a, and I served, finished my apprenticeship out there. I started my apprenticeship here. That yeah. my, my wife wasn't in good health yeah. and I wasn't doing the best uh, yeah. financially and right. things. And her family was there. So her family we, was in Colorado? Correct. But uh, they had moved out there several years before, oh, okay. and uh, so we went out there for two reasons. One, to see if I could benefit myself, us, and also yeah. so she could be around her family. Okay. And now I'm going to tell you something that you don't know. <coughs> we have something in common. Yeah. You were in Denver, Colorado in 1962. Well, right. in a, a part of it, yes. I was too. Yeah. I, I was in graduate school. I was yeah. at the University of Denver when you were there. Getting, getting work as a plumber. Yeah. Small world. I, I had uh, not per se, but I had worked on projects, a couple projects that uh, under the Mercury system. Oh, yeah. Had, it was the only one at, with our company that could get yeah. security clearance. Oh, okay. Now it didn't. It, it pertained to the construction work and stuff, uh -huh. and uh, I was the only. Nobody else could go in their work in our group unless I was with them because I was the only one that could get some security clearance. Okay. And I also worked on when the Air Academy. Oh, right, sure. yeah. When the Air Academy originally started in yeah. Larry Field. Right, right. And I also worked on those buildings, converting those yeah. for, for the cadets to make them uh, the barracks. Right. They take, converted them, made them private rooms and everything, fixed yeah. them all up nice and neat. And That's before sorry. they moved down to Colorado Springs. Correct. Before Over they the built. Academy. Yeah. Correct. I remember that because yeah. they, their football team played at the University of Denver State. Right. Uh, and that was about the time that the uh, Denver Broncos were starting up in their mm -hmm. professional football team. Right. Tell me a little bit about your educational background. I mean, you mentioned that uh, you were in plumbing trades, but uh, what, what's your formal education? I have very little formal education. I, my wife and I both, <coughs> we got married when we were to 16 years old, but my parents, I was, my mother died in 1937, my father died in 1930, and there was nine of us children, and some of the older ones took us, three younger ones, and kept us, so yeah. I don't have, I went to the old Kamak school, <laughs> and, and I don't have very yeah. much formal education. Okay. That's one reason that I'm so stuck on union principles. Yeah because the union did take me yeah. and give me the opportunity to 661 originally. Yeah. I started out with uh, uh, 
gave me the opportunity to learn a trade and to pr and prove our status and uh, livelihood and that kind of thing. And uh, of course, then when we moved to Denver, why uh, I found the local number three out there. Uh -huh. So I'm very much union oriented yeah. and very much, uh, I'll put it this way, basically indebted to the union for the benefits and for the education that they helped me get and what have you. Okay. Where, where did you begin uh, your working career? Did you have jobs here in Muncie before you went out there? Yes, sir. I um, began my first working career when when I got married. I worked for base better known as Ernest Nursery, which was out oh, on yeah. 32 yeah, sure. West here, yeah. and I worked for them till uh, he decided that uh, he could get somebody that a little better qualified and things, which was an older gentleman than I, <coughs> and then I went from there to better known back then as the old Glasscox factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the gentleman there by the name of Elmer Gard was a personnel man. Okay. And I went in there and talked to him, and he's, <coughs> and I, he wanted how old I was. I told him, I said, I'm only 16. Yeah. He said, well, we can't hire you because we've got uh, machinery and stuff, and you're not, you can't run machinery, you're not, we're not allowed to let you in. <laughs> so as I was starting to leave, he said, wait a minute. I told him that I was married. In fact, we just, our baby had just been born. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, wait a minute. He said, I think I got a job. And you can. So he hired me in basically is what they called as a checker. Checker. Uh -huh. And uh, when they made 105 and 75 mil uh, shell casings oh, okay. for the government, and they had to have an uh, ordinance number on them. Oh, sure. And it was my duty to see to it that they were stacked properly and categorically and according to the ordinance numbers so, and keep that separate and so they called it a checker. So I originally started out my uh, in those two categories. These are artillery shells? Yes. Oh. You know, 75 millimeter and uh, which was an armored uh, piercing shell and 105. Yeah. That's, that's big time stuff. Mm -hmm. Pretty good stuff. Well, how, how did you get from doing that to get into plumbing? Well, I, I didn't get into the plumbing until after I came home from the Army. Oh, okay. Well, I can't, uh, but later on I went uh, in the Army and they, uh, when I got discharged from the Army, why, uh, I, I wasn't having the best of luck to find a decent job. So uh, I had signed up for uh, my unemployment benefits and what have you under the GI Bill. Sure. And uh, the lady told me that she suggested that I take and learn something because I didn't have a, a real good education. Yeah, right. She said, you yeah. need to learn something that you can do uh -huh. to make a living without depending on somebody else. Uh -huh. And I, uh, Good point. And I had, at, uh, at the time, uh, also later got a job with Central Indiana Gas Company. And I liked that type of work, and uh, so I got talking to some of the union officials, and like I said, they accepted me yeah. and signed me up as an apprenticeship. Oh, okay. How long was that apprenticeship? Five was that years. Apprenticeship? Five years, okay. So at the end of five years, then you're a uh, journeyman? Correct. Okay. When, when and, and where did you first become involved in union activity? When I went into to, uh, the Glass Cox factory, okay. they were, uh, if my memory serves me correct, was uh, uh, CIO. Okay. I don't remember the exact title for the CIO back then. Congress of Industrial Organization. Right. Uh, and uh, and they, uh, I got involved in there, uh, the first union I belonged to. Okay. So, go, so you go out to Denver and then you come back. Was that a time when Chevrolet Muncie was hiring a lot of people? Yes, sir. They expanded a lot. Uh, the new edition, what they called the 62 edition and the 64 edition. Yeah. And the Ford shop was running very strongly at that particular time, which we don't have anymore either. Right, right. And yes, uh, I had, uh, there was two of us gentlemen that applied for the job. Yeah. And uh, the personnel man told me, he said, well, that was, that they was going to give me uh, the opportunity because I was a few years younger than the first opportunity and the other yeah. gentleman. But they wound up hiring both of us. 
later on they hired him also. So when you went into the plant at Chevrolet, if you're in skilled trades as you were, then what you're really doing there is you're a plumber in a big transmission plant. Correct. Tell me some of the things that a plumber does in a big transmission plant. Well, basically, you don't do too much actual plumbing work. It's basically what they call pipe fitting. Oh, okay. And there's uh, quite a little difference in the category yeah. of the two, but we still, uh, anything that had liquid running through it, like water, uh, uh, oil lines, and what they call yeah. soap lines, and pumps, yeah. and uh, that stuff, what well, we did. Uh, we di I did a little bit of uh, actual plumbing work, but usually basically just maintenance. Okay. Because I, uh, on the plumbing, it's per se. Yeah. Were you mostly on first shift? No. Oh, okay. I spent most of my time on the afternoon shift. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not an early morning person. <laughs> when I was at work outside, I didn't have to be at work till 8 o'clock in the morning and okay. spoil. Okay. <laughs> how, how much control do you have over that, or is it based on seniority? I mean, it, as far as the shift that you're on? Primarily uh, based on the seniority. Okay. Uh, 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 I was on days all. Well, you're automatically on days for 90 right. days right. Okay. because nobody can bump you. Okay. But as soon as I got my 90 days, what is yeah. the man on second afternoon shift, yeah. and he wanted it, so he bumped me to the afternoon shift. Okay. So the whole time you're working out there, you're on afternoons? Just not all of it, but most of it. Probably, yeah. I, I would say probably 90, 96, okay. 95, 96% of the time. I didn't work very much days. During your career there, did they have very many uh, what I call regularly called strikes or wildcats or things like that? Uh, I don't recall. Uh, we had some strikes, but we didn't have any. Uh, I don't recall of any wildcats. Okay. We had. But I think we had, in 1970, we had a pretty long strike. And a couple other times we had a couple short ones, primarily on you know, 70 was a national. Right. But, uh, a couple other small ones that all yeah. oh, maybe last a week, if that long. You know, just but as you look back, what were the major issues in those strikes? Major issue uh, was uh, pro probably working conditions. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, were the major issues because uh, you know uh, skilled trades people are pretty protective of their uh, status. Right. And they didn't want, we didn't want to be doing electrician's work right, right, and yeah. so on, see. Right. So, uh, uh, but working case conditions primarily. I think one time it was over somebody that was, yeah. was discharged uh, unfairly. Okay. See. When, when you look back on that part of what I call people achieving the American dream, regard to wages, fringe benefits, pensions, and all those sort of things. When did those various things come in? When, when did the UAW get those? Well, a, lo a lot, lot of them were already there when I went in. Okay. Now, maybe not a lot of them, but some right. of them, because that's why I went in there. Right. However, they in, increased uh, the benefits down through the years, and I think 1970 was one of them when they when we wound up uh, some other benefits like our prescription right, right, right. deal and our eye class yeah. care yeah. And, and even our hearing and different things. Okay. Okay. But uh, but that's primarily why I wanted in there yeah. because I'm working on the outside now they have got it anymore but working on the outside back then they didn't have that type of, of, of stuff. See. So would it, would it be fair to say that the major reason why you wanted to have a job there was security? Security, correct. Uh, okay. Both, both through, through uh, working my working life and right. also uh, after my retirement. Yeah. Okay. You know, when you think of your long career uh, working for a place like Muncie Chevrolet, and you think of the entire city of Muncie, were jobs like you had at Muncie Chevrolet Warner Gear, were those among the very best jobs that you could get in Muncie at that time? 
Well, it wasn't a category of, of some of the best, but right. but there was other places besides those two plants that okay. paid good wages. Well, that's what I'm asking right. about. Yeah. Right. There's other. There was other plants, and, and, and excuse me. There was other, uh, uh, even outside, uh, that there was other that even paid a little better wages than really? what we did. Oh, okay. okay. And they, well, for example, uh, like I said, when I went in there. Here I am a skilled tradesman, and I, I'm getting three dollars and three cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the guys that's working outside in the construction work right. is getting in the neighborhood of seven dollars an hour. Really? Say, uh, so. <coughs> but that was more seasonal. No, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the construction. We used to have some good big plumbing companies here in the city of Muncie. Hudson and Company was one. How do you spell it? That's all. I, I don't. I don't remember. That uh, I had a nephew that worked for them for years, and uh, but uh, they were a big plumbing company. Had done a lot of industrial stuff right. for both the Delco Battery yeah. and Chevrolet, Bart Warner, yeah, and sure. Pepsi, and and it, it wasn't just so much seasonal yeah. at that particular time. It wasn't. Right. Yeah. But you don't. We don't have any of those around now. But we don't have much of anything around. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other story. We'll yeah. get to that. Um, <coughs> did you do any particular kind of work for the union? I mean, I know that you're now the president of the 499 retirees, but did you, did you do any union activity when you were involved uh, during your work life? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I was uh, chairman of the, what they call the Skilled Trades Council okay. for several years. I also uh, was a uh, delegate to uh, several of the of the bargaining conferences, okay. and I, I was also a financial secretary uh, for one for a term, and and then of course uh, since 19 I believe 83 I've been uh, chairman of the retirees right. chapter. Okay. When people think of of unions, they think of unions as being <laughs> this is small D yeah. now, democratic, <laughs> but very democratic in the way that they function. I mean, can you, can you, when you were working with the union, can you tell me some things about how that democracy within the plant, within the union, actually worked? Well, uh, uh, it, it, it worked real good in most cases. Okay. Uh, and occasionally, and of course, as you probably heard, that I am somewhat of a, uh, been somewhat of a union rebel, too. <laughs> I don't always agree with everything that, uh, that the, uh, our unions has done. Yeah. And, uh, and same as the one, but uh, democratically, yes, uh, we've been very uh, prone to go along with the majority rules. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, we also been very prone to uh, when we have debates and meetings and things to to let the opposition have their say. Okay. We don't that we don't <coughs> would necessarily agree with them. Same as, like I said, a lot of it yeah. I'm not agreed with, but but the, uh, yes, we, I think we've been a very democratic okay. organization. Uh, do you mind telling me some of the things you don't agree with? Some of the things I don't agree. Yeah. With? Well, uh, for for one thing, I don't I don't exactly agree with our political uh, status, okay. uh, better known as our cap council. Okay. Uh, I've never, they've never convinced me and <clears throat> that the, uh, because you're a Democrat, you're the only candidate could should be voted for. Okay. Or if you're a Republican, right. I've always been, uh, believe that, that you should study the candidate mm -hmm. and, and their positions and things and learn as much as you can about them and then make up your mind. I don't know, I don't agree with that. And I have gotten a lot of hot water over my standard status on this. I have been uh, chewed out a few times. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Are you, you know, I, I mean, I'll tell you mine, if you tell me yours, I mean, are you yeah. still a registered Democrat? No, sir. You're not. Are you a registered Republican? Yes, sir. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. Now, that's pretty unusual for union guys. Correct. All right. And I catch some static from it, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say probably everybody I've interviewed would say that he, or in the case one person, she, is currently a registered Democrat. So you're not typical of that group. No. Okay, when did you change your registration? Uh, well, I changed my registration several years ago okay. because I didn't agree with 
that uh, some of the things that are at the present time that are uh, <coughs> chairman of the Democratic Party. Okay. But I have never ever voted a straight ticket oh, okay. one time in my life. Okay. So you you're really looking more toward the candidate. Correct. And what the candidate represents. Correct. Okay. Well, I'm assuming that probably in the days when you were in the union and I. My old friend from Ball State, somebody like Phil Sharp, probably had your support. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, Phil Sharp, I'm, I'm the only union man that I know of yeah. that ever stood uh, down on 8th Street out front with him and passing yeah. out passing yeah. out his literature. Yeah. yeah, well, I did the same thing from the university standpoint. Yeah. In, in your distinguished and long work career, how would you describe the relationship between management and labor in this town? I, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to really say, was it one kind of relationship in the past and is it different today? Well, it's been certainly different today okay. because uh, it used to, I know when I was in the shop, right. uh, uh, so many times that you had, you had a complaint uh, you could take it to your supervisor okay. and nine times out of ten iron it out. Okay. But, uh, but the sad part I was, that tenth time is where all the rub came in. Okay. Uh, because okay. for some reason or another, uh, maybe it wasn't he per se, uh -huh. but management position, well, this is the way it's going to be, like it or not, this is the way right. it's going to be. Right. And if you can't sit down and negotiate and get this stuff, uh, uh, you know, worked out where it's benefited but everybody, then right. we're in trouble. Okay. So let's take a point in time. Let's say uh, 25, 30 years ago, was the relationship between management and labor more difficult in Muncie than it is today? Do you think it's better today? Well, uh, that I can't really answer because I'm not involved in that category with okay. it anymore. But uh, but from 25 years ago right. and to up until, well, I'd have to go a little bit more than that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, back in the early stages, yes, management and labor from what it was early stages. I had an older brother that was president of the old Acme Lease oh, yeah, right. Union. Yeah, right. And, and the, uh, uh, it was a lot a lot tougher to negotiate with management back then yeah. than it was for my status, I'll put it from 62 forward. Okay. Now, even in the early 40s, it was still tough. Uh, management was very tough to deal with. Okay. But during, let's say, I don't know, just pick a time in the 1970s, 80s, that relationships between management and labor became better? It was easier to negotiate contracts? I, I would say probably in in the mid and the late 60s oh, okay. and and uh, up until maybe the mid 50s management was a lot easier to to uh, uh, negotiate with okay this is a kind of uh, footnote but you know these things so I'll ask you a lot of people have talked to me about the grievance procedure and I, the question I'm posing to you is, what kind of things do people grieve? I mean, if you're going to have a grievance, are there some that are more standard things people grieve than others? Well, I, I think so. Uh, I've been accused of, you know, grievance on little petty things. Okay. <laughs> but I've also uh, been uh, challenged for some of the major issues. Yeah. To give, to give you a good example, uh, when I, uh, I was a, uh, still chairman of the council in there, we had a new electrician. Yeah. Well, this electrician was doing work that belonged to machine repair. Okay. What's, 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 and so the other guys come to me complaining to me about it. So consequently, I go to him and, and I tell him, I said, now, uh, uh, this isn't your work. This work belongs to uh, machine repair. Yeah. Well, I know how to do it. I can do it as good as they are. I said, I'm not doubting that. However, it, in here, yeah. you, do, you do your electrical work, 
and, and we each do our own type of work. We don't cross lines of demarcations right. unless we're working with somebody. Now, if you're working with somebody and helping that individual do it, it's a little different. Yeah. Well, he got very upset. <laughs> Oh, huh. yeah. he was going to do it anyway, so yeah. so I went and told my supervisor, I said, I want to come anyway. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the next the next evening, we come, <laughs> yeah. I go into work, and uh, it wound up into a little physical <laughs> rumble, <laughs> really? uh, which yeah. it shouldn't have. Yeah. But what happened was, when I came in, we were in the same maintenance area, and he started on me. And I kept telling him, I said, Ray, you were wrong. So, uh, uh, and I said, you didn't want to cooperate. So we, I had no other alternative. So anyway, I thought, well, <laughs> if I go over here, back, back over here and sit down, maybe, maybe he'll go in and leave me alone. So as I was walking back to my place to sit down, he's like a little dog. Right behind me, yep, 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 yeah. and nipping at my heels, see? <laughs> well, of course, of course, I had enough, and I turned around and blasted him. <laughs> oh, see? <laughs> <laughs> Which I shouldn't have. Yeah. But, uh, but those but things can lead to that sometimes. But, but it, led, it led to that, and uh, he tried his best to get me fired. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. oh. But it didn't work, because uh, oh. like, <clears throat> like, the anyway, bargaining chairman told me, said, well, what was you doing back there in his corner picking at him for in the first place? <laughs> said, I think you got what you asked for. <laughs> but, yeah. but, uh, so that's how yeah. those things work sometimes. Right. Yeah. But if, uh, sometimes you have to file little petty things to get management right. to correct something else. Right. Which, right. But uh, as a whole, uh, you can take and uh, talk to your immediate supervisors and, and get it corrected. So in most cases that process worked. Correct. Well. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. What do you think unions in this country have done for the worker? Oh geez. They, 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 they have done everything for the worker. Okay. Right. Tell me more about I've, that. I, I've heard my older brothers and, and uh, brother-in-laws and that tell me the stuff that they had to contend with when they first went out to work. And I've heard her, her daddy lived to be 97 years old, and he worked over at the old Indiana Steel and Wire. Oh, sure. yeah. And the, uh, the things that they, they had to do in order to keep their job, I mean manually, right. uh, they, they wanted to work them like oxes yeah. and, and all, only pay them chicken feed. And uh, yes, the, our unions is the greatest thing that uh, I think has ever happened to our country uh, in all categories. Uh, but uh, we haven't made our share of mistakes also. Well, that was my next question. Because <laughs> I was going to ask you, what do you think specifically then are some of the advantages and disadvantages of unions? You know, kind of contrast good things you talked about. What are some of those negative things? Well, I, my, when I when I came out of there, uh, my my pay was ten dollars and eighteen cents an hour, and honestly, I didn't earn ten dollars and eight. I think we got a little out of line on our wages. I think that if we would have uh, restricted ourselves on the wages a little bit better, and maybe governed ourselves on more productivity. And then our benefits. Mm -hmm. I think we would have all been a lot better, better off today. Oh, okay. See, did you have a lot of opportunity while you were working at Chevrolet for overtime? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I mean, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, were there times out there when you could pretty much work as much overtime as you could get in? Well, in some categories it was. However, in the skilled trades, it wasn't because usually they they took work so many people rather than a normal 48-hour week, right, right. Which, which was normal for yeah, us right. back then. <laughs> but some, cat, some categories in, in uh, production workers and that, well, the other one didn't want to work, so uh, they let this one pick up extra time. Oh, see. Okay. But on the skilled trades, uh, yeah. basically, it, we, we were restricted. Okay. I should have asked this before, but 
when you talk about skilled trades and production line workers, what's the differential in dollars for the wage between skilled trades and unskilled trades? I, I, when I was in there, I think it, I think it was in a neighbor a neighborhood. It varied from a dollar and a half to two thirty seven. Okay. And depend on what cat and uh, of course, electricians made a little more money than what pipe fitters did. Oh, they do. Okay. And so on, tool yeah. makers made more money than electricians made. Oh, really? See? Okay. And so it kind of, yeah. you know, kind of depends on what okay. category you what, what, uh, what job in that plant in the union would be at the top as far as wages? I mean, who, would, who made the most? The tool workers? Uh, correct. Okay. So that, that's, the, that's up at the top and then it goes down yeah. from Yeah, it graduates down at different steps. Okay. Okay. Plumbers are what, kind of in the middle of skilled trades? Uh, we're probably a little above the middle. Okay. Uh, okay. During the time that you were out there, uh, this is of course a question that a lot of the people on this project are interested in, in, in finding out about, but did, did racial issues play a lot of importance in people getting jobs in, in places like Chevrolet and so I don't think so. Now okay. we did, we, we had, you know, some uh, areas where there was a but not being in the, in the higher union category out there or right. management, uh, I, I don't I don't think the ratio issue was too much. Okay. Now we did have uh, a slight problem in the uh, uh, upgrading some of our uh, racial people. A good example, uh, we had we had a young man in there that wanted to be a pipe fitter, okay. and they. Uh, he was black, yeah. and he and I was chairman of the Skill right. Trades Council. He was black, and and the, uh, in our national agreement, it specifically stated that what we called an EIT was an employee in training. Okay. See, and in our national agreement, they were to go by seniority. Right. Well, this man had more seniority than the white man. And I got in a lot of hot water over this one too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I went to bat for the black man. They said, well, he can't even read a rule. Huh. I said, so what? Yeah. That's not it. That's nothing to do with it. That's our responsibility to teach him. Yeah. That's why he's coming over here as an employee in training. Oh, okay. Well, there was three or four of these gentlemen that worked in there, yeah. the brothers and what have you. And they were very, I mean, the white ones were very upset yeah. with me. Huh. And anyway, we got it corrected, and lo and behold, probably, oh, maybe six to eight months later, they all three come to me and apologized to me, said, you were right, Faisal, uh, said, uh, uh, and this one, he really apologized, I mean, he said, I should never ever say the things I said to you, but, uh, but yes, we had, uh, but not, not, not very much. Okay. What about the, the role of women at Chevrolet Munson? How, how did, did they fit into the plan as far as working and uh, working with union activities and things like that? Yes, it did. Okay. Uh -huh. yep. And we had, we had a lot of women that was very active in our union and, and they, uh, was, uh, most of the time if you, had, if you had a union meeting, the women seemed to be more uh, custom or uniform to showing up to the meetings than what the men did. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> When, when I came to Muncie to join the Ball State faculty in the late 1960s, a friend of mine up in Michigan where I was living at that time had lived in Muncie for a few years and he said, you know Warren, you need to understand if you go to Muncie, it's a really tough union town. I think that was an accurate description of Muncie in the late 1960s? In the late, as a, late 60s? Late 60s, it's a yeah. tough union town. Well, uh, Yes, it, we, we have always, I shouldn't say always, but since I've been old enough to be involved, yeah. we have been a good, strong union okay. town because about everything belonged to union. Okay. Mark was belonged to union, silver plate belonged to union, yeah. and, and you name it, it belonged to union. Yeah. E even <coughs> since when the Indiana Gas Company, right. when they were here, uh, their people belonged to the union. Right. And it has been a very, very okay. strong union town, correct. Okay. But that's changed now. Pretty much so because uh, we we haven't got anything to, uh, to to give us a status quo. On. Yeah. Well, the jobs aren't there. 
Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I came here, I think what that person was saying to me was that, that Muncie and Anderson, and to take another example, maybe to some degree Kokomo, that these were towns where unions played a really powerful political role. They were important in the social life of the community because right. there was a lot of brotherhood among the members of the unions. The unions supported each other. Right. If this union went out on strike, other unions would support the union. Correct. Uh, and I think that's what he really meant. Uh, now, as you point out, because the jobs aren't there, I think it's swung the other way. It's a, you know, it's a, I mean, really, Basil, in all sincerity, what the people in this project I'm doing represent is almost a time that's not there anymore. Right. I mean, everything you've talked about in terms of what the union did for your life, especially economically, that just isn't there for a 16-year-old kid anymore. Do you no. think that's fair for me to say that? Right. Okay. Now, if you're right. 16 years old now, and or even if you're a high school graduate now, when I came here, those people could go to Gear, they could go to Chevrolet, they could go to all these plants in Muncie, get a good job, good wages, good fringe benefits. What do you do now if you're 16 years old? Well, of course, of course, if you're 16 years old, you couldn't went into plants anyway. Right. Well, it takes you know, somebody who's a high school right, graduate. Right, but 18. a high school graduate, yeah. uh, well, let's, uh, let, let, let's use our youngest son. Well, okay. both of them, our oldest okay. son and our youngest son, okay. for example. Uh, our youngest son, when he graduated from high school, went to work for Delco Better. Okay. I, I don't think, I think they graduated one week and the next week went to work, him and, him and my nephew. Yeah. Uh, our oldest son, he graduated from high school out in Denver, right. and I got him in over at uh, Chevrolet. Huh. See, he passed the test and everything, yeah. but he didn't like it, so yeah. he didn't stay. But yes, uh, th those those aren't there anymore. Uh, yeah. Doesn't regard as to where you go, they're just they're just not there. Not not Muncie or or Anderson or anywhere for that. Well, matter. that's at right. least with industrial jobs. Like right. That. I mean, there aren't too many of them around anymore. Correct. Uh, the last question I want to ask you, which is atypical from other people because of your involvement in a lot of civic affairs. When did, when did you retire from Chevrolet? I retired. Uh, I had a massive heart attack oh. in, in '78. I went out on disability. Okay. Uh, and uh, in 1978, but technically, I had to be on sick leave for a year. Right. So actually, I didn't retire until uh, until the uh, 80, uh, 1980, okay. according to the records. Okay. See, but actually, I've been out there since 1978. Well, what I'm getting at in your case, <laughs> which is how I know you before we got involved in this project and I really got to know you, is when did you become so interested in, in civic affairs and community stuff? Well, I, I uh, blame part of that on the... Uh, <laughs> You're blaming it. <laughs> yeah, I blame part of that <laughs> on, on to our local people that got us involved in this great justice center down there. Oh, and, okay. okay. And, I, I used to, even when, when I was in the hospital there for a good while. <laughs> so I didn't put you in the hospital. Well, I, I, about I that. was in there when I had my yeah. overhaul job, and I read the paper, and I kept reading about this guy <laughs> down there, screaming and hollering about this and that, and yeah. nobody else but Richard Amber. Oh, yeah, Dick Amber. And, yeah. and, and so my wife and I was talking one day, and she <laughs> said, well, why don't you call him? So I did. Yeah. And I got involved with him, but I was still, I was interested in our political aspect before, but not to that extent. Right. But that's what really got me the deepest. Okay. But then when we got involved with that, uh, I don't know if you know Steve Fields or not. Yeah, I do. But Steve, yeah. Field, Steve Fields and I, and Dick, worked with Dick Amber mm -hmm. immensely. And you'd be surprised at the stuff that we got for him. Uh -huh. but which was fine. Yeah. We got it for him, and he got the credit for it. And that was fine. I had no problem with that. Right. But after he got elected office, he didn't want him to do this. Really? Uh, really? Yeah. And, and but but the problem was still there. All the problems are still there. <laughs> right. And, and uh, like reading the morning's paper, <laughs> yeah. I want to get off of this a little bit. With, uh, like reading the morning's paper, and our great mayor brags about 
what all this community has accomplished and everything. Well, if it's so great, why, why do we lose so much of our population in the city and the county? And why is our unemployment rate still 0.4.8? See, and now if our economic uh, stuff is so great, uh, and I don't, I don't like for people to lie to me. I don't like to be lied to, yeah. and I don't, I like to be. I definitely don't like to be lied on, like some of them has done. Well, the difference is, in your generation, which is part of my study, a person could get what you would define and I would define as a good job. And a good job to me is a job with a decent wage and decent working conditions and decent fringe benefits. Correct. Now, it seems the definition of a good job is, well, maybe you can get a job at Walmart. Yeah. Or you can get a job at uh, Myers or something like that. Well, you're not going to provide for your family or send your kids to college or have retiree health care if that's where you're going to get a job. That's right. Well, I mean, that, that's not my definition of a good job. I, I assume it's not yours. Absolutely not. Another good example, when me and that little stinker got married, yeah. I went to work out there at Ernest Nursery. I worked 50 hours a week yeah. for $22.50. Yeah. Okay. But you know what? <clears throat> that wasn't a lot of money, yeah. but we could have paid our, our apartment rent. We paid our apartment rent. Yeah. We, had to, we had to pay a little extra in the wintertime for our fuel mm -hmm. and so so. And we, yeah. and we didn't have a whole lot of money, but we always had maybe an, enough at least maybe to go to a show yeah, or yeah. something out of that. Right. That is no longer there. This yeah. other stuff has got so far out of line also sure. that if you don't have a job of making at least, I believe they say 14 mm -hmm. an hour, mm -hmm. you, you can't survive unless, yeah. you're, unless you can get assistance from some yep. public welfare system. Well, a lot of these jobs you're talking about and I'm talking about aren't paying any 14 30 an hour. Correct. They're not there anymore. And they don't have any fringe benefits. Right. No fringe yeah. benefits. Correct. And, and they... Uh, so, so the Justice Center is really what first sparked your interest in, in all the civic stuff? Well, uh, it... Uh, I'm going to say I it first it. sparked it, but, but <laughs> it got me more interested. It yeah. got me... As I call it, the injustice. Center. Yeah, right. <laughs> But I, I loved what Harry Truman said when he ran for president yeah. uh, the first uh, the first time, see, and we, our politicians not yeah. paying any attention to it, said, take care of this country first, yeah. then we'll worry about yeah. the rest of the world. Right. Right. And I le also liked what, uh, I believe it was, a, uh, I can't think of his name now, <laughs> Our president was uh, during our revolution. Uh, oh, George Washington? No, no. Oh, which revolution? <laughs> I mean, uh, really our Civil War. Uh, oh, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. I never, I can't, uh, no. <laughs> I, I like what he said to a man that tells you that, that he hates uh, uh, capital or hates labor is a liar. Yeah. Right. See? And a man that says that, that he does, uh, that he, loves labor and doesn't love count, uh, uh, capital, he's not truthful either, yeah, no, and right. vice versa. Yeah. So no, I, right. I like those two those yeah. two quotes, and mm -hmm. I also like the quote that Harry Truman, Truman made. So, so since you retired and got interested in, in civic affairs, uh, I mean, do, do you go to council meetings and stuff like that? I try, do my best to attend most yeah. of them. Now, the ones this week I, month I've missed. Yeah. Because uh, a couple of weeks ago I had some physical problems oh, okay. and wound up in the hospital, yeah. so I. Oh, I so you feeling okay now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, I just have to act up yeah. now and then get tuned up. Well, yeah, you, you're getting tuned up. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed talking to you about that. Do you, do you think you know, this is a tough question? But here's a mayor who's been in office for a while in Muncie. I mean, I'm almost at the point of concluding that maybe towns like Muncie that are losing industrial jobs and aren't really replacing them with jobs that really attract people and get them to stay in Muncie, whether they're high school graduates or college graduates. But maybe towns like this have become almost ungovernable. You just, you just, there's not much you can do in a town like a Muncie to attract the kind of jobs that were part of your life. We, do, we can't blame it all exactly on the mayor. Well, I'm not blaming it all on him. No. But, <laughs> but, uh, I, think, I think our council people has a, a great role in this and they're not stepping up to the plate oh, okay. 
uh, I, uh, I have advocated for years that our tax rate in this community, now I'm not sure about this, but it, but it has been the second highest in the state of Indiana for several years, now where, where it falls now. <clears throat> the biggest reason, in my opinion, the biggest reason that we have lost some of these, uh, well, we'll say manual transmission. Yeah, right. Sure. Did you ever look at the yeah. taxes they pay on that place yeah, over there? Yeah, I know. See? Yeah. And every, every year yeah. they raise it? Well, you think you think that those people that in these businesses, mm -hmm. uh, if they're kind of like General Motors or right, right. has been, or even Ford or any of them, has been restricted the last few years on how, on their capital yeah. uh, gain and yeah. what have you, do you think they are going to sit back and continue to see this escalate and escalate? Absolutely not. Yeah. Just like they said, they like told us, we'll shut the doors and we'll bulldoze her down. See, they'll make money by bulldozing it down oh, sure. because they want to yeah. pay that taxes. Well, it's the same thing with that Delco plant. Out there. Right. When the Delco battery plant was built, I can remember getting a tour of that, and people saying, this is the state of the art. This is the greatest battery plant in the world. Right. And a few years later, they're out there tearing the darn thing down. Well, <laughs> it, 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 uh, Bart Warner, I think, laid off a little over 200 people just a few weeks ago. Yeah, right, they did. Okay. Now, when this thing gets going out here, this new magnet plant, yeah. if it gets going, right, yeah. uh, and supposedly it's going to hire 410 people. Right. Do you know how many people that possibility we might lose from Bar Warner? About the same number. Huh? About the same number. Well, I, I've been told it'd be a neighborhood of 275 people. Well, that's only a 200 gain, then, if you're going to have 400 and you lay off 200 here. But you're not going to gain, because yeah. the, the salaries aren't the same. The, south, the wages over here right. is going to be considerably less than what the wages are at Fort Fort, Fort, yeah. at the gear, Fort see. Yeah, right. yeah. uh, and uh, so if, unless they can do something about getting this tax structure yeah. under control and our infrastructures yeah. under control, yeah. our community isn't going to grow. You can, we could take in the whole state. And if the same people run it, right. it would still be the same thing. But we're going to make money, Basil, because we're going to lease the toll roads. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that foolish? <laughs> For 75 years. Mm -hmm. All I could say to my wife there is, well, I won't be around to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, uh, it's like I told our retirees yesterday in yeah. our meeting yesterday. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not going to hurt me. Right. But God, uh, what yeah. are they going to do to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? Yeah. I like a pair of shoes on my feet. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, I think of uh, the kind of situation I have with pension and benefits and things like that, and these changes aren't going to have a dramatic effect on my life or my wife's life, but I think of my kids you know, who are in their early 40s, and I think of my grandkids who are just little, you know, ranging mm -hmm. in age from 2 to 14. I mean, their world is going to be a whole different world oh, than yeah. the world you experience, right. or the world that I experience. Well, those are all the formal questions I have, and at the end of my interviews, I always give my interviewee a chance to add anything that he wishes. So this is your chance to add anything you wish to talk about unions and your working career or anything else. Well, one thing I, I would really like to add to it, and one thing I appreciate you guys oh. doing this, because uh, uh, this the first time I'm almost 80, I'll be 80 next month, and I have never ever known any organization to come out and have an interest hmm. in getting the, this, uh, the Pacifics on what union stands for yeah. and uh, some of the things that union people uh, are against and some of the things right. that they're for. Yeah. And I, I think it's just great to get this kind of get out. Uh, hmm. And the, uh, of course, because I guess I'm somewhat of a nut. Uh, this is still the. It's still the greatest country yeah. in the world, That's right. and I can't see them giving all of this stuff to foreign countries, yeah. and we're not getting anything, anything basically in return. Well, I'm happy to hear you say that because uh, you know I, I I will formally give credit on the tape as I have in public pronouncements, and that is this is an idea that Hurley Goodall had for a long time, yeah. and uh, he really wanted to get this done, and asked me if I'd participated and I'd done a lot of research on Muncie's little towns, so this is just a part of that. But Curly's right and you're right 
in saying that this is a part of Muncie's very important history as the nation's middle town that people haven't heard before. I mean, uh, as Hurley sometimes jokes, he says, well, you know, you guys out of Ball State have a lot of books on the Ball family and things like that. So you don't have any, any books and any historical materials on the people who really are the, the, the heart and soul of this community, and that's the people who really work to make Muncie Muncie. Mm -hmm. right. so, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. Hurley and I, we had our, like I said, when he was a representative, yeah. we had our different opinions, yeah. too, but uh, yeah. I've, always, I've always had a great admiration for Hurley. Yeah. Well, there's no question where Hurley's heart and soul is. I mean, mm -hmm. I've never met anybody in my work in Muncie as a historian of this community's rich past who is as dedicated to the working people of this town as Hurley good old. Yeah. No question about it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. your time. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Uh, one thing I, I did want on that record to, yeah. to give you, I told you, because like I said, I'm quite sure you've heard about me being somewhat of a rebel. <laughs> I guess I do hear that. But, you know, uh, we had a rumble a few years ago over to shop at, not with the union, excuse me, not with the shop. And uh, I didn't appreciate what our international union done to it. So I filed a complaint with, with the Department of Labor. Uh -huh. Well, the Department of Labor just was ignoring it, wasn't doing the sitting on, sitting on there, yeah. that brought me on the butt set. Yeah. So I fired a letter off to our president. <laughs> really? <laughs> so uh, one morning about 6.30 in the morning, the phone rang and this guy was hot. And his name was Humsucker. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, from the Department of Labor. He was, he was very disturbed. Well, anyway, we, we got a move and got through the process, and primarily I lost, uh -huh. but, which I shouldn't have because yeah. They didn't really listen to what what was going on and pay attention yeah. to it. Huh. But uh, but uh, I I guess like I said in about all categories, especially in the uh, political, I'm not afraid to work. Uh, I don't care if it's my job, how dirty it is, I'll do it. But they uh, but like I said I don't like for people to pass the buck, yeah. and I don't like people to lie to me or or about me. Well, thank I, you. I've had a little bit of each. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for your candor. Hey, you're more than welcome.